this is an interesting spot that actually you and your teams produced while you were at Comcast. Obviously, in the spot, you're trying to say that you have real new fast speeds and your competitor who in the spot is featured as an AT&T worker um, doesn't. And you're, uh, again, comparing him to the famous folks who really didn't, who who were kind of telling a fairy tale, the big bad wolf wasn't, you know, um, or go, I'm sorry, Goldilocks, um, there was Chicken Little in there, um, Pinocchio was in there. Obviously, there's are all fairy tale characters who, um, who who weren't exactly accurate all the time. And so tell us about, um, you know, tell us quickly about your thoughts in creating this depositioning spot, you know, to help improve retention so customers wouldn't leave and go to AT&T. Yeah, no, great, great question, Lucia. Those were fun days, but um, the, the, the reality is when you have a competitor that's coming in and making claims that are is negatively impacting your business, and 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 frankly, they were just not not true, which is why which is why we kind of came up with that theme of um, you know the support group and with people who were very famous for not speaking the whole truth, and and so it kind of in a fun way of just basically calling out that what these people are saying isn't true. Now, just to give you a little history on that spot. That was the fastest. I got plenty of during my tenure as doing advertising with uh, with Comcast. I got plenty of whether it was from a, a lot of variety of other competitive companies getting cease and desist letters, you know, from from them. So you know you have to stop the commercials and everything. But this one, you know, I think this one it took like I don't know 16 hours before we got the, we got the first one. Um, but the reality is the, the when the advertising board looks at it, it's like, look, none of this stuff is untrue. You know, that that th these claims are are false and you're misleading the consumer. And so, you know, again, obviously Comcast had a, a, a large amount of budgets and, you know, could could do the kind of resources that way. But it, it just the overall point of depositioning, it, it's really can be used effectively to deposition your competition but also reflect on you know hey you've got really good speeds on on the data capability and these people even though they're saying they do they really don't kind of look under the hood so it, it's a it, it is a good tool to have in the arsenal on certain occasions when somebody is is out in the marketplace making claims trying to take your customers um and and you just need to make sure you respond and, and sometimes you can do it in a funny and amusing way and make the point and you're not necessarily being indignant and oh you know they're lying they're this and that you know you kind of do it in a funny way and deliver the message the right way it can be very effective yeah that's great i i put another one in the chat um for those of you with us today you don't have to watch it right now but it's a south it's an example of just a quick southwest um 15 second ad and um, in the ad, it's, it's Southwest is exactly doing deep positioning as well against the other airlines. They talk about two free bags and you know other things that you actually have to pay for with other airlines without actually mentioning the competition. They're really deep positioning themselves against the competition, who you know have larger fleets and newer planes and first class seating, and you can select your seat before you board. You know, there's a lot of the things that Com that Southwest doesn't do. You know, that sometimes they're known as the low cost, no frills airline, but really they want to be seen as you know we're being a little flexible. We're not going to make you pay for bags. You know, and we we don't make you pay for um, uh, ticket changes and things like that. And the, the way that they do their depositioning messaging, I think is very effective and, and not only works in short form video, which is very popular right now, but also can easily work in social and um, programmatic and even, and even search as well. So I'll leave that one. That's the second link in the chat for everybody to go look as another great example um, of depositioning. So in other words, our third point today is really know your competition. Do you have something really different and unique that can't, that can't be copied and replicated that you can really leverage even if you're not the market leader to deposition against your um, competition and and consider depositioning but make sure it's for the right reasons and that you are established in the market as Rick suggests. Now the fourth area that I know Rick you shared you'd like to talk about 
it was really around loyalty and loyalty is a big word when it's when it's considered part of retention um, but in you know in the simplest form it's how do you reward your best customers in some way that's usually low cost to you and I'll give some examples you know airlines again you join their loyalty programs you get miles you get free tickets but they do other things for their best customers like allow you to board first or you do also get a few one or two um, free bags as well. Um, car rental companies, um, when you come in to rent your car, they may offer you an upgrade. It's not really an upgrade, it's really them managing you know, inventory, but it seems like one to you and you walk away feeling good about it. Um, you know, in retail, it might be something like no question returns, like Nordstrom's, you know, been famous for, um, or even Amazon actually does uh, no question returns within 30 days, and you can just drop it at the UPS office. Um, but Rick, you know, you've long been again in this retention business, and you know how how can companies really think about you know loyalty rewards, whether formal in a program or informal, you know, as you know, marketing term surprise and delight will say, you know, what are some some options for companies to think about loyalty? Yeah, no, great question. I want to circle back for one second to the Southwest ad, and I think it's it's a really great example of a company knowing taking advantage of pain points and doing the research. And consumers say, I just hate being nickel and dime with extra bags. Mm -hmm. And so they're, the, the, it's two pronged. It is deep positioning, but it's also uh, emphasizing a consumer benefit for using their service. So I just wanted to bring that up. Yeah. And Lucy, honestly, on the loyalty piece, that's a very interesting space because there's a lot of things that you can do, you know, ranging to your point of, you know, giving away things that, you know, whether it's boarding first. Um, that don't really cost you anything. In fact, you could argue it makes it more efficient because the, the people mm -hmm. who are frequent flyers get on first and get settled in and and go from there. So uh, so that is a great one, you know, and usually in a loyalty crew. I mean, obviously the airlines, I think the airlines do it really well. Uh, a lot of credit cards do it really well. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, sort of concierge type uh, programs that if you're a certain level, you get, um, you know, for instance, like Bonvoy, if you're a titanium member, you, you get some perks. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, so there are a lot of things, I, I think you have to go, this one is probably the most, I would say, I don't want to say the, the difficult, the, the, the difficult to pull off cost effectively and how, what's the sustainability of it. So you really need to look at your business and say, where are the points that I can reward my loyal customers? without you know, d diminishing margins to too great a degree. Now, I may be willing to forego some of the margin because these people are frequent purchasers. So think about your Starbucks loyalty cards, although, gee, now you got to have 200 stars to get anything. But anyway, I'm not bitter. Um, but the, but, but the, the point of that is you know, there, are, there are certain things that you want you know, to, to incent your, your top customers, but then also how do you get other people in the ecosystem kind of moving up along the value chain as well. And, and what are the things you put in place? So to your point, Lucy, what you said is, look, you can do some things that are just like every once in a while, hey, by the way, you are a 25th customer, you get, you know, a basket of whatever. Um, you know, so there's there's a lot of differences in loyalty. I think, like I said, I think the the airlines do a really good job. I think some of the hotels and the credit cards do a really good job. Um, of, of getting those programs in, but they are not, those things are not to be taken lightly because they are a lot of work to manage, a lot of work to, okay, who's in, who's out, if somebody dropped off, somebody. So there's a lot of things underneath, depending on the complexity of your program, you know, okay, I got to qualify with X number of miles, but I didn't hit it. Uh, you know, what, what all of the, those kind of changes from data going back and forth. But I do think there are certain times where it's really effective. And if you look across the, your entire you know, life cycle of your customer. What are the points in there that maybe they, you know, at, hey, at 18 months, they're vulnerable. So maybe there's something I can do there with those particular groups of customers to help, you know, ensure, you know, ongoing continuing business. So, you know, loyalty is a, a very interesting one. It, I don't want to say it's advanced, but it, it, you know, used and done right, it's extremely effective because like you said, I won't, you know, use Avis as an example. You know, I love being able to, pull into the airport, 
my name's on the space. I go right to the, I don't have to worry about, you know, going in, talking to anybody, you know, whatever. I don't like talking to people anyway, but um, the, uh, the reality is that's the kind of, that's the kind of customer loyalty you want to instill with a loyalty program where people, they feel like, look, you're recognizing my business and, and me as a customer, and you're giving me things that have utility in my life. And I appreciate that. And I will continue doing business with you because I don't want to stand in, in the rental car line and, and fill out a paperwork and give them my license and everything. It's just, it takes friction out of the relationship when you have a really good loyalty program. Yeah, I think with loyalty, the one thing you have to be careful of is though, like what you said, which is constant and consistent delivery, um, mm -hmm. because for your most valuable customers, if you flub the loyalty part of it, like it's even, they're even more upset. So you have to be really careful about that. So I hear loyalty is a good thing to consider as you're looking at retention, um, marketing activity that you can do, but re be really careful about understanding that that loyalty event is something that helps retention and that you have the people to manage it and the budget to really support it and that you're getting a return on it as well. Definitely yeah, agree we, with all that. Yeah, so we're, yeah. we've talked about four great things here today. Sorry, did you want to add something? We're, we're about no, to go no, to just, to, just to wrap up the loyalty piece is I think you need to go into it very specifically and very methodically because you know just because you say you want to have a loyalty program to say you have it is that that's just the death knell of that you have to go in really strategically really based on data saying i need to i need to address these particular things and this is how i'm going to do it via a loyalty program because a lot of people will start one up and then realize it's it, it's not giving them it's not accomplishing the business objectives so just be just be cognizant that you need to you know, have specific sort of metrics on what you want to do, whether it's customer satisfaction, you know, whatever those metrics are, and you're measuring that versus, hey, we want to give away a, you know, a free candy bar with everything because it just makes us feel better. Yeah. And I think what you're also saying is that you don't have to actually have a published program. You can do loyalty type things for your best customers um, you know, again, just to keep them retained and whatnot. So we've talked about four great things today, Rick. Um, Larissa, you've been um, capturing questions along the way. You know, do you have a question or two for us? I do have a couple of questions. Um, so what are some of the most common retention mistakes um, that you may have seen? That's a good one. Well, I, I think, you know, it's a great question. Uh, I think probably just going back to what we talked about with loyalty is, uh, well, the retention mistake, The how, how long do we have? Um, <laughs> I mean, it, it's a cautionary tale all, along the entire life cycle. The retention, I, I think when people go and, and they think um, without necessarily getting a lot of data and doing a lot of research and consumer feedback, you know, it's sort of, I think this will help. You know, people will feel better if I have a picture of me with a puppy. You know, it, it, it needs to be strategic and well thought out of what am I trying to do with this retention activity and is it going to work? So from a tactical place, there's obviously a laundry list of things you can do depending on the product and service that you're marketing. But you need to be real surgical and really and, and do a lot of that, you know, analytics of is this is this what customers will want? Because Many times you get in these boardrooms and CEOs and, and chief marketing officers, you know, they all have great ideas. And like I said, oh, let's give everyone a baby unicorn. Yeah, that would be everyone, no one would leave us if we gave them baby unicorns. You know, but it's like, okay, well, what is, what is the ultimate objective? And are we dealing with the biggest problems? You know, are we addressing, if I'm looking at the, again, the fish jumping off the boat, am I plugging the biggest leak with that particular tactic or initiative? And that's where I think you just, Larissa, you have to go through and be very, you know, disciplined in what's the biggest problem, what are the things that I need to do to fix that problem, and then move to the next one. Because sometimes people want to put this hugely, um, you know, sophisticated automated marketing trigger programs and all that stuff, which is great. If you have the sophistication to do that, that's fantastic. Hey, at day 15, they're going to get this. Day 23, if they've called into the call center, they're going to get that. You know, all that stuff, that's that's perfect. That's a beautiful roadmap. But can you pull it off? And are, 
are those uh, levers, as we talked about before, are those the hinges that swing in a big door? Yeah, Larissa, I would say two things. One, the biggest mistake is not ensuring that your customers onboard well and start their relationship with your customer in the most positive manner. Because when they don't, then every single thing that happens after that, big or small, they have that thing in their mind like this isn't going well. Versus if it goes really well in the beginning and along the you know along their their life cycle with you, you know, something goes wrong. It's like, wow, this is really unusual. They're usually so good. And so I would say first make sure that your customers are onboarded, you know, as best as possible. And um, second, I would say don't boil the ocean. And I think Rick echoed this as well. What are the three things that and that you can do relatively easily? It's scalable. You know, what are the three things that you can really do to affect customers? I know when I was CMO at Pods, we, for example, didn't have a retention desk. And my head of service came to me and said, so often people just um, stop renting with us because they say it's too expensive. And they literally get a moving truck and go to their container and pack their moving truck and then they move their stuff to a cube smart you know or a public storage and really we just needed to have a conversation with them to say oh you know you know you've had some financial difficulty you need a, a small discount great we can give you a 15 percent discount if you'll stay with us and and stay with us for a year for example and so we finally created a retention desk and we're, we were finally able to, you know, somewhat manually solve a lot of these problems, but the customers were so happy and, you know, there was a lot of work reduced on the customer's part and, you know, our part as well. So it's just some, some small things. So we just basically needed to create a call queue that was for retention and then we could actually address the customer's issue. So that's a small thing. But when you, um, when you, try to boil the ocean or do things that are very small and you can't scale and it's really not going to make much difference in the end you know it's it's a lot of work for very little um, effort or very little result I would say so really look at your major things and how you can really um, um, scale and and attack the most important things that will have the most benefit which probably sounds intuitive, but every once in a while we need to be reminded of that. I think that actually lends quite nicely to the, the next question. You know, I heard don't boil the ocean and do what you can. So this is actually what is some of the first steps you would recommend in developing a retention plan or maybe the top three? Where to begin? Yeah, that's a, a great question. I think, I think number one uh, is, you know, understand unless you've got a brand new product launch understand where people are leaving you that to me is number one is is where along the life cycle are people leaving and you have to have good data to sort of say this is and and then get good data on why they're leaving at this point and then what is what is the reaction you know call them up say you know hey that is is so important because people will tell you there's either a product some kind of product deficiency some kind of service deficiency you know what it is because you need to attack those you can do all the best commercials, you can do all the best materials, you can do all the best recovery things in the world, but if you have a systemic problem that you're just not addressing, then mm -hmm. that's the that 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 to me is, you know, kind of number 1, 2 and 3. It's like you have really good data on when and where people are going so you can you can begin to it put together the right program. Because you know, so many times people will go, "Oh, this is probably cool and let's do an ad or let's you know, let's send them a coupon if we messed up and everything. And all those may be, may be great, but they might not be addressing the core issue of why someone is not satisfied with your product. So customer feedback and prospect feedback is, I think is, is where the starting point for everything. Get really good data so you understand, you know, I, I, I don't want to be a, you know, I'm not a solution in search of a problem. You yeah. know, it's like, oh, well, we should do a cool, you know, cool campaign. And it's like, okay, well, is that addressing the issue when the actual issue is, you know, our whole time when somebody tries to call us is 33 minutes. You know, let, right. let's deal with let's deal with a lot of those issues first, and then get more, you know, elegant as you move down the chain. Yeah, I love that. Um, it, actually, with that, I think we're about 
time. Um, I don't see any more questions that did come in, but if you have anything that you think of after, um, feel free to ping me um, when you get the recording tomorrow and we're happy to get those answered for you. That's so, great. Yeah, so, so thank you, Lucy, Rick, any last uh, comments? Yeah, no, and thank thank you, Larissa, for having me. Um, this is this has been great information, and I, you know, it makes me think about all the things that I'm thinking. Oh, I should have done that when I was working it. Um, but no, I think obviously from a retention standpoint, it's it's just it, it's it can't be. I don't think the importance can be overstressed because so many people fo focus in on acquisition. How do we grind through getting new customers? But at the end of the day, having you know, taking care of the customers that you have and getting them to purchase more and longer ultimately on the PL, that's going to win. Yeah. Well, great. Thanks so much, Rick Lang, for joining us today on Movers and Shakers. And thank you to our sponsor, Porch Group Media. Uh, and we will see everyone next time. Thank you. Thanks all.